Uh, good morning to the conference attendees. Um, I'm very pleased to be here this morning. Uh, this is a great conference and I'm proud uh, to personally be a part of it and for Optic to be a part of it. Let me start off with a short introduction. And uh, by the way, I welcome anybody who would like to get the, a copy of the slides that I'm presenting or who would like to have further discussion on any of the topics that I discuss, um, my contact information is on this slide and please feel free to reach out. I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Um, I'll tell you about what I do at Optiv. I'll begin with that. I've been with Optiv for, for two and a half plus years and I deal with organizations across Canada in the public, private and not-for-profit sectors. And I engage in discussing cyber programs, potentially lack of cyber programs, where organizations would like to take their cyber programs, how they want to evolve it over time. Um, my background in coming into this role is I spent uh, 30 years with the federal government. Um, 20 of those years I spent with communication security establishment, our cryptologic organization. And uh, of that, uh, two years were spent leading the Canadian relationship with the National Security Agency in Fort Meade, Maryland. That was a tremendous time uh, because you all know about the NSA. Um, after that, I went to be the CIO of Correctional Services Canada, which took me across the country um, in different institutions, helping with obviously the IT environment there. From there, I went to, uh, to be the CTO and CIO of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And my last job with the feds was running a small agency reporting to parliament called the Security Intelligence Review Committee. We reported to parliament on CSIS activities, both in Canada and abroad. So essentially my whole career has been around uh, one form of cyber or another, um, offensive, defensive cyber, and uh, a, lot of, a lot of emphasis on privacy. So that's, that's what I bring to the table this morning. Um, let's just go through the agenda. Um, I'm going to start by talking about pre-COVID complexity in our environment. You know what 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 that looked like for us pre-COVID, and then of course we were hit with COVID, and the question we asked ourselves is, you know, were we ready for that disruption? Whether we were ready or not, we had to deal with it. But did we have organizational IR plans, BC plans, and so on to help us navigate to this new normal? Um, I'll talk about the uh, cyber impacts of COVID and then talk about, you know, the new normal that we find ourselves in and what does that really look like and how is this modifying our cyber programs in the future and, of course, moving forward from there. So where were we before COVID and um, every organization is different and organizations have different cyber programs with a focus on their business and alignment with their business. But where we were before COVID was um, our industry was characterized by resource shortages. Um, that was a reality and those resource shortages are becoming more and more acute over time. Um, good example of that is try, or, try to hire a cloud engineer today. Uh, they're, they're hard to find, they're in demand. Um, we typically had, typical organizations had compounding technical debt based on legacy systems, the legacy systems that they had to have to support. Um, this is really acute in some organizations. I've been, I've been talking to organizations that quite frankly, you know, 90% of their operational funding is being spent to keep their existing systems up and running. And that doesn't necessarily give them a lot of time, a lot of funding for innovation moving forward. Um, most organizations prior to COVID had started on their digital transformation, moving to the cloud. Um, some were, were, were well along, others were, were thinking about it, but I, I think this was, this was common for most organizations in that we were, we were thinking and we were moving to the cloud and we were moving you know, some, of, some of our data applications so on to the cloud. A lot of organizations did have a policies and were set up for, for a limited amount of work from home. Uh, a lot of organizations, of course, had uh, business continuity, IR plans, so on and so forth. They exercised these plans. And if they had that, that, that you know, typically made their COVID move easier. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the CISO and what he or she had to do, but um, their environment of course was, was very complex and projected spend 
and how, you know, they sometimes struggled with how do I portray this to the board? How do I become much more than a cost center? How do I become a business enabler for the organization? And of course, um, a lot of scrutiny around, uh, around CISOs, around cyber. You know, when I started, uh, when I started my career in uh, 1988 uh, with the federal government, um, you know, threats were academic in nature. Uh, they were they were very different. And fast forward to today, we are getting a lot of publicity on threats and the evolution of threats as we move forward. So I don't think anybody will argue the complexity of our environment, the the threats, the vulnerabilities, um, they, they seem to be rising exponentially. Um, we have regulations and standards, we have compliance, uh, depending on the industry we're in. And there are one heck of a lot of security technology vendors out there. How do we make wise decisions? How do we make right-sized decisions for the future? These are all things we had to, to take into account uh, prior to COVID and of course, moving forward. Now the security program itself, um, you know, the best programs that I see are really aligned to the business. The business has a lot to say, is part of the risk committee, so on and so forth. The security program is right-sized for the organization it's prioritized, and what I mean by prioritized is, is a roadmap for the future, roadmap for the future on, on how we are evolving that program, how we're evolving over the 12, 24, 36 month timeframe. And what we know and really characterizes our program is it's never completed. And it is somewhat interrupt driven as we've seen in COVID and in other disruptions. So um, I'm certainly not going to read these uh, CISO concerns. I think uh, I think everybody on on this session has has either lived these or observed these. What I'd really like to talk about here is you know the the CISO who measures, dashboards his or her program, communicates his or her program to the leadership team, to the board, if they are governed by a board, so that the board is cognizant, leadership is cognizant of, of where the organization is from a risk perspective, because we all know it's, it's about risk management, it's not about risk avoidance. I think, you know, historically, if we went back a number of years, um, we wanted to, to tell our leadership that we weren't going to be had. That's just how it worked back then, and we didn't admit to it. Um, and certainly there was not the press and the publicity around it today. I think, the, I think the CISOs of today are telling their organizations, you know, chances are we will be had in one way or another. We will judge ourselves by how we respond to that. How, how have we mitigated that risk? How have we exercised uh, disruption, whether it be ransomware or, or anything else like that? And, and the CISO communicates this and communicates this in, in the appropriate language to the board and the leadership team. And I think, you know, every board should ask the couple of questions. You know, the first question should be, how are we doing? And, you know, fine board is not a really good answer. Um, we need to uh, communicate to our board how we're doing from a risk perspective and have them sign up to that risk. And once we know how good we are, we want to determine how good do we want to be and have a plan to get us there. That, that's really important for the future. And we are in a fairly good place if we had all of that up and running prior to COVID. So the CISO challenges, um, these will be uh, these will look uh, pretty basic to you, um, but really getting back to basics, inventorying what we have, what we have on prem, what we have that's cloud based, what we have being supplied to us by other vendors, so on and so forth. Um, rationalizing what we have, and you know, I'll give you an example here. When I was uh, when I was CIO of Corrections. Um, I asked exactly that question, you know, what is our inventory of applications? And, and we went out and got the inventory of applications and um, I decided, okay, you know, we should have half this many. And, um, you know, quite frankly, that was, that was from the top of my head. That was a speculation on my part, but I saw a number of applications that, that I thought were, were competing with each other, were, were doing the same thing. So in fact, we rationalized those applications to, to half of what we had. 
that gave us more time to pay attention to, to our inventory of applications, to better manage those applications, to better manage patching those applications, so on and so forth. So, so back to basics, step back and take a look, inventory, rationalize, optimize and, and demonstrate that. And that's really, really important from these ESO challenges. And we'll get into the post-COVID conversation on that. And what, you know, what does that really look like for us moving forward? Because we know our lives have changed. We know our professional lives have changed. Um, where we work might have changed from a location perspective. Really, really important stuff. So I think we're all on a, uh, I think we're all on a security journey. And the question really is from this journey perspective, you know, where are we? Um, are we operating based on some very key people that if they are not available, we're, we're in serious trouble? Um, do we have, you know, you know, I like to use IR as an example because it's something that we always need to, to take into account. Am I ready to respond? Have I got playbooks? Have I exercised those playbooks? Am I ad hoc? Am I infrastructure based? Am I compliance based? Am I threat based? And how do we how do we move up that journey and really communicate where we are? Very, very important. Um, COVID-19. Well, this is no surprise to anybody. Um, you know, it, it, it astounds me today on, you know, May 12th, 2021, that we've been at this for more than 14 months. Um, when, when COVID first hit, uh, I know I sat back and, and thought, you know, this will be an absolute disruption. Um, from my employer's perspective, services that we provided, you know, on site, we had to pivot and provide them remotely. And we did so very effectively. But, you know, we thought this is for a short time frame. I was still making appointments, you know, three months out in other cities in Canada because, yeah. We'll, we'll be good by then. Very soon realized that that just, you know, wasn't to be, and that was not going to be the case as we move through the different phases of, of COVID. And, and who knows, we can speculate on where we're going. Um, I think a few months in, when we came to the realization that uh, this is here for a very long time, it affects our organizations, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I think we had to establish our, our battle rhythm um, you know, when, when we have an incident, if the incident lasts 24 hours, you can treat it a certain way. But when, when this is a new way of doing business, we had to get into that rhythm. We had to take care of ourselves. We had to take care of our organizations. Some people had to go in to, to their place of work based on what they did. Think of the healthcare sector and other sectors where, where you had to be there um, if you're managing critical infrastructure, so on and so forth. And then, of course, a number of folks were able to work from home. We had to really think of, you know, our employees, our contractors, they're remote. Um, you know, the CISO needs to really think about, you know, where is my data? Where is my organization's data? And what about privacy management? Uh, very, very key features for us and factors that we had to consider. So working from home, and we spoke a while, we spoke about working from home. I know, I know, um, you know, talk about working from home or an alternate um, location, uh, because, you know, I've seen a lot of people during COVID, uh, you know, for a change of scenery have, have gone to an Airbnb or potentially traveled elsewhere to work from an alternate site. We need to be ready for that. We need to, we need to think about if they're, if they're working from what I would call a hostile environment. Um, our, our employees potentially working from a coffee shop for a change of scenery when coffee shops are open, those sorts of things. So we really need to needed to initially, from the COVID perspective, focus on our operations, keep our operations up and running. That was absolutely critical, and nobody will be criticized for that. But as we as we got into providing our operations remotely, we now had to think about okay, you know, how are we going to secure these operations? really, really important. Um, we have to think about equipment. And not every organization was prepared to, to send their employees home with a device or already had a portable device. So we had employees working from home with shared networks, not necessarily secure networks, shared devices. 
um, you know, working on my device all day and uh, the kids using it for gaming and other things in the evening, we had to think about these sorts of things. If we had some sort of monitoring where we were monitoring employees in the home environment, what, what are the legalities of now monitoring their children? not knowing who is on that uh, device at any particular time. And we'll talk about identity a little bit later. We lost the buddy system when folks were now working from an alternate location. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, we've trained people to be security aware. We've trained, trained them to be inquisitive. We've trained them to, to look at incoming emails from a risk perspective. Well, you know, when you're in the office or you're in that type of environment, it's pretty, pretty easy to turn to your colleague and say, hey, I just got this weird looking email from HR. Why are they wanting me to validate X, Y, or Z? You, you can now get into this type of conversations. You might not necessarily phone somebody to do that. And, you know, talking about uh, organizational data, classifying sensitive data, um, we now have information outside of the confines of our organization, which, by the way, we've had for a very long time. What are we doing from a risk mitigation perspective? What are we doing from a data governance or compliance perspective? What about the efficiency and optimization of getting to information and analytics around that information? So, you know, it started to sound a little bit like, like zero trust. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit later as well. You know, employees working from an alternate location, I maybe don't know where they are physically. Um, they may be open to, to what I would call traditional eavesdropping techniques, those sorts of things. And you know, what about the, what about the malicious or an un, unintentional uh, insider threat? I'm a little bit of a, um, maybe a bit of a traditionalist in that, in that respect, in that I, I really worry about that unintentional insider. And when I call it an unintentional insider, I'm really talking about somebody doing something incorrectly. Um, because they don't have the appropriate training or they're in a hurry or whatnot. We don't see too many um, malicious insiders, but they do happen. And, and there's been some very high profile malicious insiders um, from various you know, communities. And uh, we, need to, we need to be cognizant of that. So you know, it all comes down to your, your identity and data and how are we allowing people to work from alternate locations. The other thing is I use the term, you know, battle rhythm earlier, because as, as we've gotten used to the, this alternative way of working, I've talked to, to folks in various sectors who, who said, you know, who have told me they feel, you know, up to 50% of their staff will not come back to the office full time. And they will allow them to, to have a shared schedule in the office at home, so on and so forth. Um, so, so we need to build for that. And um, that's really important as, as we're moving forward. What are we building towards? And are we always getting better from a cyber program perspective? Because that's really the goal is to get better all the time. Okay, let's talk a little bit uh, about um, what I'll call the adversary advantage. Um, there's no question there are a number of bad actors out there. Uh, there are those who want to do us harm. There are those that want to get access to our information. There are those that want to shut down our pipeline. All kinds of examples of this today. As I mentioned earlier, you know, roughly 30 some years ago when I began my career, you wouldn't read about this uh, in the newspaper. Um, you wouldn't necessarily see the director of CSIS out in public commenting on foreign threats. You know, those were, I mentioned, I use the word, they were more academic or they potentially seemed academic in nature. The state sponsored threat was, was alive back then, but it was alive for different purposes. You know, who would have thought that we would read about foreign meddling in a US election, that that, that would be so prevalent and that the community would speak of that very openly. So we've got a number of adversaries and there's no doubt that they ramped up when, when COVID hit us, because what are they in the business of doing? They're in the business of compromising our systems. They can find that uh, very, very lucrative or from a state sponsored perspective, it can be very lucrative from an information perspective, um, from data leakage, grabbing hold of our information or positioning for some form of attack. Um, hackers or criminal organizations are, are very motivated 
exceptionally motivated, they're highly capable, and they're very well funded. Um, and they will exploit this vulnerability. They will exploit COVID because, you know, clearly as, as we quickly pivoted to, to remote working, they were there to take advantage of that from the human element perspective, from that vulnerability. Um, and we saw, you know, phishing, smishing, phishing campaigns coming at us all the time preying on businesses, preying on human beings, and of course, trying to maximize the return for, for their own purposes. So, so um, unfortunately, there's, there's no shortage of data on, on what adversaries are looking for. Um, and, you know, we need to be really cognizant of our gaps and how we're going to move our program forward. Now we'll talk a little bit about, um, you know, data at rest and data in motion. And, you know, as we're focusing on data, it's really a good time to, to start talking, you know, in a little bit of what I would call the zero trust uh, language. Um, and, you know, really, in my opinion, zero trust is about people, devices, and networks. That's really what it comes down to. How do we secure and authenticate access? How do we know who you are coming into our system? How do we authenticate you? Um, when you're working from an alternate location. And quite frankly, I, I, you know, as we have done this for the last number of years, we had a, potentially a small subset of our organization that needed to be secured and authentic authenticated from abroad, from an alternative location. Now with COVID, most of our organization needed to be, and we weren't necessarily there already. Um, what about the least privileges model? Um, we, we want to give, absolutely want to give our, our employees, our stakeholders, our contractors access to what they need at all times, but we don't want to give them more access. Um, we don't want to give them access to information they don't need to have. We don't want to give them privileges that they don't need. And um, we do a lot of work in identity and access management. And it's an area that uh, organizations really, really need to pay attention to because I feel, you know, that is one of the cornerstones of our, of our cyber program. Really, you know, who is getting into our systems and what are we giving them privileges to, to look at? And, you know, you don't have to go very far uh, to do a Google search on some of, the, some of the big compromises in the last number of years. And they really came down to a user with malicious intent that had access to information that they didn't need to have access to, access to accounts that they didn't need to have access to. And a lot of this has to do with familiarity, familiarity in the environment, so on and so forth. So least privilege, mo privilege model is, is really important. And I like to use example here when, when I'm talking about securing and authenticating users and a least privilege model, I really like to give the example of uh, one of my sons um, who was at McMaster University and for his summer job was working in an Ottawa high-tech company in the Canada area, um, for those of you familiar with Ottawa. And he was in financial services for this, uh, for this company. And uh, when he went back, to, uh, went back to school in uh, September, um, in around October, he decided, hey, I wonder if I still have access to, to the network, to the systems where I was uh, working in the financial area. And sure enough, he did. Um, you know, called his, uh, his boss the next day and said, hey, you know, I've still got access to the information. Maybe you want to shut that down. Um, that's not an uncommon story, or it's not a, uh, an uncommon story that as I move through my career, if we don't have a least privilege model, and I move from finance to HR, my privileges are simply additive. So, so we really need to, to, to bear in mind where our data is who has access to it and, and what access do our users have. And this really becomes important, you know, from a privileged access perspective. And then of course, you know, we want to inspect and log all activity. We want to be able to forensically go back and find out what happens because in the event of something negative happening, that could be really, really important for us. And, you know, um, data loss prevention, data classification, it's not necessarily easy but it's really, really important to the organization. And I will also often ask CISOs, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the secret sauce of your organization? What 
if it is compromised, is going to put you out of business or put you in a very, very poor light with your stakeholders. So really important to pay attention to data and data, of course, in motion. It's pretty easy to secure, but we need, we need to do that sort of thing and we need to pay attention as to where it is. Okay, let's, um, let's move on now to, to the expanding attack surface. Um, no secret here. Um, you know, when, when I started my career, um, it was, we didn't necessarily think of it as simple at that point in time, but it was pretty simple. We, we had the, and you've all heard the castle and moat analogy. We, we had access to our information within the confines of our organization and nowhere else. It was as simple as that. So if somebody wanted access to our information, what did they have to do? They had to compromise somebody on the inside. Simple as that. Um, and that's actually how systems, uh, certainly in the intelligence world, were compromised. And our adversaries would spend a lot of time and money to try to, to coerce somebody to get access to, to that type of information. Makes a really good Google search if you, if you look that one up as well. There are some cases that I think are somewhat astounding. So our tax surface uh, has been expanding over the last number of years. So, so this was not new to COVID for sure. However, um, from, a, from an expanding perspective, um, really it became an unplanned expansion. I need all that expansion was potentially characterized by consumer focused products used for business continuity, as opposed to corporate access, as opposed to, to um, as opposed to products that, that fit into our infrastructure, so on and so forth. I mentioned earlier personal devices. Um, we, we had a lot of data sitting on personal devices you lose control of that information. And if that is company confidential, um, PII or other types of information, that could be that could be very disastrous for the organization. We used to think of remote access in, in terms of small groups of people. Now it's the organization. And as we look at this and we look at our, at our organization and the expanding attack surface of our organization, we need to look at the organizations as well that we do business with because from a third party risk perspective, they are potentially dealing with the exact same things as we, we are. So we're not only concerned about uh, the protection of our data assets, uh, where those assets are, are sitting, how we are tracking them from creation to deletion, but we're also concerned now about our business partners and their expanding attack service. So third-party risk is something that we really, really need to pay attention to in this environment as well. Um, rapid cloud adoption. Um, you know, in 2020, what we've seen really digital transformation programs have leapt ahead by about five years. Those were that were thinking of it were, were now moving towards it and making it happen. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to um, I'll go back to something that a former boss of mine said to me years ago uh, when I was at communication security establishment. Uh, the then chief of uh, CSE, when we were dealing with a particular incident, a particular uh, crisis, um, his guidance was never let a good crisis go to waste. And as he explained that, um, his thinking was, you know, we've got this, this, this crisis that we have to respond to today and over the next coming months. As we're doing this, let's build the capabilities for the longer term. Let's take what we're doing within this crisis and, and having that become our moda, modus operandi, how we're going to operate in the future. Really, really, really important. And, you know, I mentioned when first COVID first came, I was naive enough to think it was going to be somewhat short term. It's turned out to be anything but that. But if we're building capabilities during COVID and we're building capabilities for, for the longer term, as we've gone through this cycle of rapid cloud adoption, but we're also looking at it as our future because, you know, in my time in IT, I've never seen new capabilities be brought back. So, so cloud adoption, our rapid cloud adoption is, is here to stay. Let's build those capabilities for the future. Let's pay existing. Let's pay, pay attention to our existing capabilities and build them for the for the future. You know, 
cloud security is, is a main concern of ours. We know that existing tool sets don't necessarily work in a cloud environment, or there, there are functionality issues in the cloud environment. We have to we have to pay attention to that. And as I mentioned also, you know, in this environment, we're also competing for, for skills and tradecraft to move it forward. So let's, um, let's talk about our uh, changing perspective. And, you know, this is, uh, this is maybe future focused and, and where we're going in the future and what we're thinking about. So, so without question, and this has been around for, for a while, but, it's exasperated with uh, COVID. You know, the perimeter no longer exists. We know that. How do we want to protect the most sensitive of our information, whether that is employee information, customer information, tradecraft? Um, how do we protect information with the disappearing perimeter? As I mentioned earlier, how do we implement a zero trust model such that we know where our information is? we know who has access to it and we can forensically go back and look at it. Um, the path forward is, is unique for every business. And uh, this, is, uh, this is really important because, you know, if you look at a, a startup um, who started in the last five to 10 years, maybe five to seven years or so, um, they may have no on-prem capabilities. This may just be intuitive for them. Um, so, so the path forward for them is, is pretty clear. It's almost business as usual because they're, they're, they're used to this. That's, that's the way they've set up their business. Um, all, they, all they have is, is end user devices and they protect those devices. And of course they have access to, to SaaS, PaaS and other things. Um, but the path is unique for every business. I mentioned you know, my, my experience in policing. Um, it's difficult to conceive running your 911 system from people's homes. You know, that, that system, while policing has certainly tested, they have backup plans, they have contingency plans for, for 911 and other critical systems, they tend to be, you know, a hot, hot offsite backup. But now even policing, you know, uh, talking to some CIOs in, in policing, a number of their employees are going to be staying at home. Um, in fact, um, one leader in policing told me that, you know, they were having physical challenges with the capacity of their buildings. That challenge has gone away, although he now has different challenges, that's, that's gone away. And um, I really like this last bullet. We've got to be very mindful of technology, the integration of technology and moving forward in an environment where there is just so much technology to, to choose from. So, so this is really where I like to talk about, you know, a three-year plan breaking down by quarters, you know, the strategic IT plan, the cyber plan, bringing those together and, and really making wise technology decisions for the future, because we will pay for, um, we'll pay for an improper technology integration or improper choice for a very, very long time. So, so in this new world, we've really got to, to look at it with a different lens. I mentioned earlier, you know, looking at and rationalizing our technology. This is something we've got to continuously do. And we have to bake in security as we do it. Um, and I would, I would argue every piece of technology that an organization acquires they need to have thought of securing it before they buy it. That's really, really important moving forward. So essentially, um, the, premise, the premise is that we can't, as an industry, as organizations, and I'm talking typically, it really depends on the sophistication of your programs, but typically we cannot carry on as we have been. If before COVID, if we had a really good assessment of where our cyber program was, if our leadership was 100 in tune to our cyber program, once and again, communicated to them, dashboard, so on and so forth, that spoke to the board. If we had a roadmap for the future, if we had IR plans that were tested and up to date and playbooks to do so, um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can continue as we were just with that, that transition to, to digital services, transition to the cloud and doing so in a secure way. Um, 
but I would I would I would say that a lot of organizations weren't necessarily in that space, and they now have to look. You know, fourteen months into COVID, how am I building, managing, and defending my cyber security program? And um, you know, I, I was chatting to one CISO not not very long ago, and um, he told me that you know he's got his on-prem environment and he's got his cloud environment and he is spending nothing on his on-prem their transition is to the cloud so that's where all of his all of his efforts are going to go to the cloud and let the on-prem you know phase it out over time well i would argue and you know i i can't argue his thinking um but a couple of things i i suggested to him i said you know like like you've made a conscious decision you've made a conscious investment decision I would communicate that decision into the organization. I would communicate it up and I would communicate it broadly. And I would, I would assess the risk of that, of that decision because is now you're on-prem, is it going to be for the next X number of years because it does take time to shift. Is that going to be your major vector? Is that going to be your vulnerability? Is that how people are going to get in? So, so if you're comfortable with the decision, quantify what the decision means and communicate that organizationally bring people into your operational space to to let them let the business leaders you know let them sanction that as a wise decision if you have a risk committee bring it to a risk committee and talk about the risk of that approach and talk about those timelines um, and whatever you decide those timelines are you know double them just in case because things don't always um, always happen the way we want and you know Security is absolutely threatened by rapid transformation. Um, once again, no blame. That's where we had to go, but we've got to be cognizant of that. Absolutely. Um, so, so we need to be aware of that, and we need to, you know, communicate broadly because that that's really, really important. And you know, I was working with uh, one CISO in, in Toronto that uh, was making all the decisions on behalf of the cyber program. Good, good, smart, very, very capable CISO. And our recommendation was, you know, you've got to bring the business lines into those decisions because intuitively you seem to be making those the right decisions, but you've got to bring others into those decisions because that, that's really important because we want, and I spoke earlier, if you look, if you remember the mountain graph, we want to be business aligned. Business wants to be part of that. They want to see your plans. They want to see where you're taking it in the future. So as we look at our, um, as we look at our business model for information security, um, we've got our security program, absolutely. Hopefully documented, hopefully a three-year strategy and you'll, um, You'll, you'll hear, you've, you've heard how I'm really focused on a three-year strategy. I'm really focused on looking out 12 quarters. Of course, of course, with, with decreasing granularity, but I'm always updating, updating that plan every quarter, always looking out to the future. I think that's really, really important. How we govern our program is, is absolutely important. Um, I spoke, you know, of, of bringing teams into that, bringing the business into that, so on and so forth. We have our culture, we have our architecture. I'll go into, um, I'll go into smaller organizations, you know, around a hundred, in some cases in, you know, financial services, financial management, wealth management. And they'll talk quite extensively about their culture. And they'll talk about, you know, we don't want to spy on our employees, we're a family. And my view of, you know, user behavioral analytics is I'm not spying on our folks. I trust our folks, but what if their account has been compromised? What if the behavior that's being exhibited is not their behavior? As we look at our program, our organizational security program, we're absolutely going to talk about people, process, and technology. And do I have the right balance of, of the three? And, and the people, you know, don't necessarily need to be internal. They could be they could be contract they could be a service being provided but have I got the people process and technology to to take me to the future um, quite often in budget based organizations we we will at year end spend a lot of money on technology it may take us a while to to implement that technology we may not have the processes so on and so forth so 
I really like to see a balance between people processing technology. I know I, I've read and, and I'm sure you have as well, you know, up to some organizations report up to 25% or 30% of their technologies not deployed or, or not being lifecycle men, so on and so forth. We just can't afford that for the future. That's, that is uh, difficult for the organization. Let's talk a little bit about um, the security domains. And this is really how, how Optiv breaks down security domains. And, and I think you, you know, based on the maturity and based on where your organization is, um, you know, you're gonna talk about risk management and transformation. Um, where are you from a privacy perspective? How are you managing risk within your organization? Um, cyber digital transformation, a lot of what I've been talking about the last little while has been about that transformation. How do we do so in a secure way? How do we evolve the organization in a way in which it needs to be evolved to better to provide, you know, better customer experience, so on and so forth. Really, really important. How are we looking at threats? How are we managing threats? How are, you know, are we doing threat hunting? What sorts of things are we doing here? What are we doing from a threat detection and response? Um, are we, you know, do we have the, do we have the horsepower? Do, the, do we have the people to go through our logs on a continuous basis to see what's happening from a threat perspective? That's not just a nine to day, nine to five operation within the organization. What about cyber operations? How are we fusing information, so on and so forth? Really important to us. Excuse me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, identity and data management, exceptionally, exceptionally important. I was talking to a CIO this morning who uh, just had a report done on his, his cyber environment. And one of the key areas that came up was identity and access management, as he referred to it. Really important to, to pay attention to that. If I don't know who's logging in, if I don't know what data they're accessing, if they're not doing it in a secure way, I'm, uh, I'm potentially in trouble. Innovation also, I think, really, really important. I was speaking to a CIO on Monday who gave me the business problem that he is so busy keeping the lights on and his folks are so busy keeping the lights on, they don't have time to talk innovation. They don't have time to, to uh, look at, you know, applied research, look at uh, some of the fancy things we're hearing about today. And, you know, his question was, you know, how can I get to a place where I can step back and, and spend a certain amount of my time on the innovation um, that my organization deserves and needs to have? And, you know, there are answers to those questions. But those are things that we have to, we have to think about. So I, I, I really like these security domains. I really think that um, regardless of the program, regardless of the size of the organization, you, you need to think of these things. And quite frankly, there are a number of these things that, that, the indus that industry can do for you. Um, how, do you how do you embark on that? And once again, as you do that, um, if you're giving industry keys to the kingdom, so to speak, you want to ensure that, that they are um, not only serious, but you know, from a third party risk perspective, they're not adding additional risk to you as, as you're moving forward. So in conclusion, um, a lot of material. Um, and uh, once again, I will put my coordinates up uh, in a few minutes again, but really, you know, how good are we? How good were we? Did we know how good we were pre-COVID? Do we know how good we are now? Do we know the gaps in our program? And do we know how we're going to close those gaps? What gaps are, are, are here as a result of our, our mobile, our distant workforce? How are we dealing with those? How are we measuring? How are we dashboarding? How are we keeping track of this on a day-to-day -day basis? Because, you know, I'm a big believer in dashboards. I am not a big believer in, in complex dashboards that, that don't speak to the audience. And what I mean by that is, you know, if I'm presenting a quarterly dashboard to, to the board, 
there are not going to be very many indicators there, but there are going to be some indicators that my board can speak to that they're going to understand really, really important that, that they sign up to the level of risk that we're sitting at. So, so how good are we? Um, we are going to have disruptions. There's no question. We're going to have our plans. We're going to have our strategic plans for the future, but we're going to have disruptions. And only when we have a plan can we really understand the implication of a disruption and, and what effect does that have on our plan? Because if, if I'm looking at you know fiscal year 2021, I've made 32 commitments on what I'm going to deliver, bang, I get hit with an outage or I get hit with something, I need able, need able I'm sorry, I need to be able to communicate the impact of that disruption. Big, big deal for us. So let me go back. Let me go back for to the first slide and um, give you once again access to to my coordinates. As I mentioned, I am more than pleased to to um, you know give me a call, text me, send me an email. Um, I'm happy to provide these slides to any of the attendees. Absolutely, I am also happy to to be challenged on anything that I said or or provide more in depth information on on any of the aspects we talked to because none of them are none of them are simple. So quite quite happy to do that. Just don't do to me what the Ryerson student did. Um, and a quick story on that one: I gave a presentation a number of years ago at Ryerson in Toronto. And same idea, I, I told the folks, you know, uh, reach out to me if you have any questions. This was in the poli sci department, by the way. And um, it was talking about some aspects of the intelligence community. So um, the next day, I came back, I was out of the office most of the morning and came back to my office around uh, 12 noon. And I had um, three emails from one of the students from the uh, previous day from the day that I presented. And the first email was a question. The second email about an hour later was um, challenging me because I had not answered the question and um, I had told them I would respond to them. The third email about an hour and a half later um, was, well, you have no credibility. You told us you know, that you would respond and blah, blah, blah. Um, and and my, <laughs> my first reaction was, well, wait a second. <laughs> I was a little ticked. But when I thought about it, I thought, okay, that's that's how that's how real time people are used to being. So um, my point, my point of that story is, um, feel free to reach out, um, ask me for information. Let's engage in a call, but uh, be patient for at least the first twenty four hours, and uh, then by uh, by all means, you'll have an answer from me. So I think we are um, approaching the time. I believe there's a few minutes for for Q's and A's. I might not. I might have sold you a little short on the Q&A time, but as I mentioned, uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. I know it's not always easy engaging um, in these types of sessions and I have two minutes remaining. So probably time for one question. If there is one, you can pop it up in the chat or however however you can do so. And as I said, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you, John, I appreciate it. Um, by the way, I, I really sincerely hope that uh, we can have this discussion in person in Winnipeg next year. I was talking to my brother uh, who's in Winnipeg this morning and I understand it's a beautiful sunny day and I'd, I'd love to be there. Great, thank you. Well, listen, enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of the uh, conference and uh, we'll chat soon. Thank you very much to everybody.